welcome everyone to uh, the continuing Lincoln's Unfinished Work Conference. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, first uh, Thursday session of the Lincoln's Unfinished Work Conference here at Clemson University. Uh, my name is William Haller. I'm chairing the session, and our um, our first speaker is uh, Lawrence McDonald from Iowa State University, speaking on uh, Lincoln Du Bois's general strike and the making of an American working class. Well, um, I'd be remiss if not to begin by uh, thanking Vernon and Peter Reisenstadt and Georgia, and especially always for inviting me to this. And uh, as with uh, our speakers yesterday, I can lay claim to being uh, an FOV, a friend of Vernon. But even more importantly than that, um, I am a student of Professor Burton. I am an SOB. I, I, I am the last SOB I can claim. Um, I'm not the greatest SOB in this room, I will say, perhaps, but I am the last. Um, that's not to say there sh that we don't need more SOBs in this world, but um, that's up to Vernon. Um, Today, I want to uh, begin by uh, uh, working off of an idea that I came to from Vernon and some of, uh, some of his great colleagues who have passed, uh, Burt Wyatt Brown and Chaz Joyner and some other folks, the, the folks who thought about uh, emphasizing big questions in small places. And uh, years ago, back in a different century, I had the privilege of meeting Eric Foner at the University of Maryland, and I came away wondering, why are Reconstruction scholars so far, so much farther down the road than Civil War historians? So that's kind of where I'm thinking about today. Unfinished work. How far that simple, monumental phrase stands from the tenor and content of most Civil War studies. Both in popular culture and academic writing, the war remains a decidedly finished military conflict, fought between armies clad in blue and gray on precise battlefields that even children can rhyme off, conducted exactly, more or less, <clears throat> between, between the bombardment of Fort Sumter in April 1861 and the stillness that fell so memorably over Appomattox four years later. Of course, we all recognize, at least since Little Women, the war was felt on the, war, on the home front too, in the South quite often in the shape of ruined cities and farms stripped bare. And the war followed soldiers into prison camps, asymmetrical guerrilla warfare, and the travails of civilian life in the post-war era. African Americans had a war of military glory and general emancipation too, we are told, intersecting awkwardly yet undeniably with the real war. Year after year, books, articles, roundtables, documentaries, reenactments, commemorations tumble forth in a torrent, affirming these themes and parameters as though Lincoln had never spoken that November day at Gettysburg in 1863. No single phrase in any document, civilian or military, shows more plainly how Americans have misunderstood the social parameters and central meanings of the Civil War, nor the great task that remains for us as scholars and citizens to undertake in years to come. Unfinished work. Strip away all talk of glory and heroism. Um, do we not hear too much of these things these days? Lincoln's address is shorn of such cant. Peel back abstractions of duty, symbols of nationalism, ideals of man manliness so destructive and misleading for so long. Lay aside remembrances of comradeship and the personal pain of the vacant chair. Lincoln's words point us toward a different, unexplored meaning understanding of the Civil War as political and social experience. America here is far more than a republic of suffering. It is a labor of creation and recreation. Labor, or pardon me, war, Lincoln says starkly, is work. And nearly a year after the Emancipation Proclamation, even at the hour of the second inaugural, that work seemed unfinished. <clears throat> 
The soldiers who fought the war made the same point in thousands of letters, diary entries, petitions, and regimental orders that scholars and buffs alike have almost willfully misread, lusting after a different, better war. Within, mount, within months of enlistment, usually within days, soldiers' fantasies of heroic fighting and triumphal return home ran up against a very different reality. Recruits spoke again and again of soldiering as labor, talking not of battle but of their job, not of killing but of work. Lee's men called Mars Robert the king of spades. Stonewall's forts, footsore troops cursed fool Tom Jackson for overworking his men on the march and in battle both. For Thaddeus Capron of Illinois, victory at Gettysburg meant the Union armies were going to work in, in earnest at last. 120 casualties at Resaca was reckoned a small loss for the work that we did. A dead soldier had done his work in common parlance and could now take his rest. Elisha Hunt Rhodes, one of the central figures of Ken Burns' Civil War documentary, filled his letters home with discussions and descriptions focused on labor, though these were perhaps a judge too dull for primetime television. Great is the shovel and spade, he genuflected. If I live to get home, I shall be fettered for any kind of work, for I have tried most everything since I, since I came into the army. For most Americans who volunteered or were drafted north and south, Civil War military service marked their first sustained encounter with wage labor under the eye of a boss, and most, find, most found the experience shocking. Soldiering had none of the independent manliness about it, um, recruits discovered quickly. It was coerced, regimented labor of the lowest sort. Soldiers' letters and diaries record their dismay in vivid terms. Common soldiers were small fry, with no rights, expecting nothing but peremptory orders. Thought no more of here than dogs, especially privates. They are not treated half as well as the Negro. I belong to the CS Army, now one rebel groused, and do as I am told. A soldier's duty was plain, another Confederate replied. We Negroes, he used another word, have to put up with anything that officers choose to do. A Georgia private unluckily named Freeman warned his brother against joining up. If you don't want to lose your freedom, for we are nothing better than slaves here. I have been a government mule for about 15 months, an Illinois private agreed. I have been harnessed and driven by all kinds of drivers. I have borne it with all the patience and fortitude at my command. It is no use to kick up, for the harness is strong and the driver will put on a bigger load and lock the wheel. Most find soldiering very different work from what they expected, Robert Gould Shaw summed up. But having been sworn in, they seemed resigned to the hard work and army rations. The private soldier is but an automaton, Tennessean Sam Watkins explained, a machine that works by the command of a good, bad, or indifferent engineer, with no control over the shooting and killing, the fortifying and ditching, the sweeping of streets, the drilling, the standing guard, picket, and vedette, and the drawing of $11 per month in rations. Americans had long considered soldiering as one of the lowest forms of wage labor, attracting only unskilled immigrants and the most desperate of nat native-born whites. Bound contracts, low pay, hard toil, restricted rights, overbearing bosses, and vicious punishment put common soldiers considerably closer to plantation slaves than to Republican freemen. In 1861, Americans, North and South, were willing to endure military civility on a temporary basis as a service to their nation in its hour of crisis. For Yankees, that meant the defense of the Union and the destruction of the slave power. For rebels, their cause was independence and the defense of white freedom rooted in black chattel bondage. On both sides, though, white soldiers shared a dread of being drawn into a the permanent status of a proletarian, a fate that loomed, loomed over increasing numbers across the late 1850s. A pervasive social and economic system grounded in lifelong toil for wages was the offspring of the devil, ar argued Charleston's uh, Frederick Porche. It cannot be the will of God that his creatures shall exist in hopeless degradation, toiling harder than slaves with none of the slaves' security. <laughs> 
Whatever, whatever their views on chattel slavery, warring white Americans agreed that to be condemned to a life of working for wages was antithetical to the ideals of manly competence and self-sufficiency that defined free labor ideology. Soldiering gave hundreds of thousands of young men their first close look at the fate they feared most. And ultimately, the service they rendered brought forth the new birth of freedom Lincoln hailed, though not at all in the form he or they anticipated. The most penetrating analysis of that, of that social revolution, W.E.B. Du Bois' 1935 study, Black Reconstruction in America, grounds the Union's military victory in class struggle. It was not Gettysburg, Vicksburg, or the fall of Atlanta that doomed the Confederacy, he insists. A general strike decided the war. The deliberate determination of hundreds of thousands of African Americans across the South to withdraw their labor from the Confederate cause and bestow it on, as workers and soldiers on the cause of freedom, as they understood it. Du Bois's claim, like Lincoln's, insisting that the military conflict was ultimately a labor struggle, has shaped much of the best scholarship of the past half century about the Civil, about the civil War, from Armstead Robinson's Marxian forays, to the rich volumes of the Freedom Project, to the gendered analysis of Stephanie McCurry. Strange to say, however, historians have missed clear statements within Du Bois's masterwork that his ar argument about the general strike was only half fleshed out. The Southern worker, black and white, held the key to the war, Du Bois declares, justifying his concentration on African Americans because they held a more strategic place in his view than white Southerners in winning victory. Again, he refers to the general strike of black and white in bringing down the house of bondage, though he never explained just what role ordinary white Southerners played in wrecking the Confederacy. Taking that claim seriously, weighing its meanings and merits, yields two remarkable conclusions, which I can only hope to set forth here briefly and undergird with a few telling examples that promise to reshape our understanding of the American crisis of the mid-19th century. First, if Lincoln and Du Bois are correct in their implications, if not their full argument, historians have utterly missed the greatest biracial, biracial working class uprising in American history. That thing we long for, Southern white and black unity, is long in the past, waiting to be rediscovered, I think. <clears throat> and following from that, it would seem, we have quite mistaken the meaning of the Civil War itself whether understood as the traditional 1861-65 conflict or the long civil war whose parameters extend indefinitely beyond those years. If the American crisis was more, was more than a war about union, even more than a struggle over slavery, if Lincoln was right in calling war work, was the conflict not objectively part of the greater contest over relations of production stretching from the 1840s down to the late 1870s in which military conflict itself played a crucial role in the making of an American working class? Turning back to, the, to America's Civil War soldiery, white and black, and re-examining their actions and political choices stretching outward from the battlefield, the soldier's chief work site and a, sphere, and a sphere increasingly deserted by scholarly analysis reveals a conflict that historians have only begun to comprehend. To begin with, Union and Confederate soldiers never simply fought each other. From first enlistment, recruits waged running battles with their superiors over the terms of their service, the measure of independence of action they retained, and the way they conducted themselves in camp and in combat. Mules and slaves and dogs they might be, but from officers and non-coms north and south, too many were altogether too recalcitrant to render good service. Once they landed on the firing line, Bill Fletcher argued, it was nearly impossible to keep a volunteer company under strict discipline. Back in camp nearly became altogether. This was precisely a struggle over the relations of production between military wage workers and their bosses, both civil and martial. Military victory was everywhere predicated on officers' ability to impose new ways of work upon subordinates 
preventing fraternization between soldiers and opposing armies, curtailing mutiny, desertion, and workers' attempts to control the production process. Good leaders here would guide obedient, well-trained troops in the work of killing against an undisciplined, ill-led foe. In this project, soldiers and superiors on both sides contested every aspect of military service. Many recruits balked especially at the, time, the use of time as a tool of labor discipline. The regular pace and tempo of toil, steady oversight by non-coms, and the inability of men to do as they wished when they wished were profoundly new and degrading aspects of labor for nearly all men. Well, this looks like soldiering, Elisha Hunt's Rhodes declared, exclaimed after a day of drill, and also work. Did nothing but drill, one Iowa boy's diary records laconically. Did nothing but drill, did nothing but drill, drilled ad infinitum. The worst of it was, in the endless struggle to inculcate discipline, many men came to despise their bosses. Too many could point to a leader as unfit for his place as the most ignorant private in the ranks. When cowards, thieves, and blacklegs were in command, one officer asked, how can you expect to have good troops? I am blunt. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> as these examples suggest, soldiers were daily confronted by class-based political choices. To accept their, ob their objectively degraded condition, com coupled with the humiliation of personal submission and the distinct possibility of death or dismemberment as a consequence of laboring obediently, or to resist. Many responded as working people have usually responded, denying the possibility of change and resigning themselves to their fate. Men who hoped to give a good account of themselves in camp and under fire often simply saw no alternative to gritting their teeth and going to work. Such is the lot of a soldier, one summed up. Confronted with the chaos of the battlefield, however, tens of thousands determined to stand up to their work on its own terms. This landscape was, after all, only apparently chaotic. All that occurred in this workplace had been planned, organized, and deliberately produced, like any grand task, by thousands of workers acting in collaborative and oppositional labor. We know our work well, veterans attest, attested, striving to do the job of fighting and killing according to their own talents and expertise. Again and again, soldiers describe combat as warm work, murderous work, hot work, nasty work, good work, bloody work. That's a plug for the title of my book. <clears throat> Victory or defeat here depended not on some Homeric annihilation of the enemy, but on the collapse of labor discipline. If Grant would pull a bag over his eyes and let the men go forward, declared one Illinois sergeant, we should succeed. That same logic motivated Bill Fletcher on the second day at Gettysburg, when the dignity of carrying the stars and bars was pressed upon him after five color bearers had been shot down, he gave the banner a kick and a curse and hurried onward. His job, as he figured it, was to kill Yankees, not to provide target practice for the foe. When officers shouted commands and urged troops to rally on the flag, soldiers submitted when they could imagine no better course. But given the opportunity, they combined self-preservation with the performance of duty in the most careful measure. In just the same way, soldiers on both sides resisted and retaliated against stupid and unworthy officers, even shooting down those they could not overmatch by other methods. So two units on both sides held soldiers' courts sub rosa to try recruits who fled when their comrades stuck. More risky, soldiers refused their labor individually and collectively over a wide range of issues of labor discipline. Overwork, unequal pay, cowardly and dictatorial officers, suicidal orders, outmoded weapons, degrading assignments, or simple contract dispute disputes could all spark rebellion. Some mutineers refused to obey commands and, or perform labor. Others just stacked arms and surrendered when the enemy approached. Indeed, an unsentimental view of the assault on Battery Wagner might conclude that the glory of that day belonged not to the men of the 54th Massachusetts who proved their manhood by demonstrating their mortality, but rather to the rank and file of the 31st North Carolina who refused to leave their bomb proofs to take part in the fight. What the bosses retarded as mutiny or cowardice 
or desertion we might better recognize as class-based political choice, a sensible and admirable refusal to, to perform the work of war. Across 1864 and 1865, tens of thousands of white Southerners <clears throat> made just such choices, downing their tools and walking away from the Confederate cause. That is how most journeymen and laborers responded when conflict flared on the shop floor. That is how contemporaries and historians have often labeled this resistance unworthy, desertion, a species of soldierly failure. But such men did not just turn tail and run. They made political choices about their refusal to endure a specific set of class relations and acted upon those choices. Du Bois quite correctly calls the decision of hundreds of thousands of enslaved workers to quit work and labor for freedom's cause one of the most notable revolutionary choices of humankind. But whites, both North and South, participated in their own mass expression of workers' control, which intersected with this, with this uprising and, share, and shaped the outcome of the war itself. A Wisconsin boy recalled for his father a chat that his union ha unit had with a party of surrendered rebels. They agreed with us perfectly on one thing. If the settlement of this war was left to the enlisted men on both sides, we would soon go home. Bloody work here laid the foundations of a fraternity of working men which extended far beyond Appomattox. What would the discharged veteran go home to work at once peace had been won. The war taught powerful lessons of violence and comradeship, agency and submission, capital's power, and workers' control. The general strike of whites and blacks smashed the regime of chattel slavery for once and all. But the struggle for free labor had hardly been won. Against wage slavery, there was unfinished work, which is to say war, more precisely class war yet to be won. Our uh, next speaker is Kate Masur of Northwestern University. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So I also want to thank Bert, uh, Vernon and Peter for organizing this uh, event, and I'm delighted to be here and to count myself as a newer FOV. Um, and I am also pleased to talk about this book, which I um, recently got back into print. It's a book first published in 1942 called They Knew Lincoln. Um, and I think in the spirit of this conference, the paper could actually be called Herndon's Unfinished Work on Lincoln. Um, and I'll say more about that in, as I go on. But um, this, is a, I, I, this is a talk about this, about this book. When I first came across the book, They Knew Lincoln, I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, and I had followed a citation to the library's copy of the book. And at that point, uh, the, it was a blue cloth-bound edition, similar to any copy that you might find in a university library. And I really didn't know what to make of the book. I was working on my dissertation, which was on the Civil War and Reconstruction in Washington, DC. And the book touched on some of the topics in my dissertation, but in a really unusual way. And I'll tell you some of the highlights uh, here of, of what's in the book. The book contained two chapters on Elizabeth Keckley. Keckley, as probably most of you know, was a skilled seamstress to Mary Lincoln. She also worked for Verena Davis, Jefferson Davis's wife, before the Davises left town. She owned her own dress shop and designed high fashion dresses. She had been born in slavery in Virginia, moved to St. Louis, saved money to purchase her own freedom and that of her son, and after Lincoln's assassination, Keckley became a trusted friend of Mary Lincoln. And in 1868, Keckley published her own book that told the story of her life, including her life in the Lincoln White House. The author of They Knew Lincoln had researched many aspects of Keckley's story, including what happened to her after her book came out, when she was shunned by the Lincolns and later taught at Wilberforce University before, before returning to Washington, D.C. in her old age. The book also provided details about a man named William de Florville, Lincoln's Haitian-born barber in Springfield, Illinois. Florville cut a high profile in Springfield in that era. His barber shop was said to be a meeting place for political people in town. Florville was a prosperous um, 
a prosperous man who owned real estate in both Springfield and Bloomington, Illinois. Um, and Lincoln was his lawyer in his property transactions. Floorville was also a musician who often played at local events, and he published poems and stories in the local newspaper. He also regularly gave money to the Catholic Church in Springfield, as well as to a Protestant church. Um, so he was kind of a philanthropist and a very high profile figure in Springfield. And in addition to portraits of these and other relatively prominent African Americans, they knew Lincoln also included um, John Washington, the author's renderings of stories told by old people who had lived in Washington, D.C. at the end of the 19th century. People who had once worked in Lincoln's White House or had accompanied the uh, president in his travels or encountered his, uh, the president in his travels throughout the capital city. The book also included meditations on what it was like to do domestic work for politically prominent people. Stories of people who had escaped slavery and migrated to Washington, D.C. during the Civil War and accounts of ghosts haunting Ford's theater. So this was a very interesting book and it was also very unusual. Many of the histories it contained were not sourced according to the stringent standards of evidence that a PhD student might have, especially the stories about ghosts. The author had included facsimiles of documents associated with some of his subjects lives, but in many cases there, were no, uh, there was no additional evidence to support his accounts of the stories told in the book. The book was also not a conventional history that offered a clearly told story. It was more of a pastiche of vignettes, mostly around the theme of African Americans' encounters with the Lincolns, and more broadly about the importance of black history to American history and about the dignity um, of the lives of everyday people. So I don't actually think I found a way to incorporate this book into my dissertation, but I remained really curious about the author and the conditions of its publication. Why did this book even exist? Who was the person who wrote it? And why had I never heard of him? And at that time, a quick search um, for more information about the book was not very illuminating. And this was kind of right as the internet was coming into existence. I uh, couldn't really find out much about the book. And I eventually returned it to the library, um, but continued to think about it and kind of chip away at what was this sort of very strange, very interesting book. So eventually I was able to find out a great deal. And this is John E. Washington, the author of They Knew Lincoln. Between one thing and another, I eventually um, found out that Washington was born in Annapolis, Maryland in 1880. His parents, who had been slaves until the Civil War, had died, and his grandmother had raised him in Washington, DC. His interest in Lincoln has developed during his boyhood when he lived around the corner from Ford's Theater, where his grandmother ran a boarding house and she often hosted friends in the basement of this boarding house. Now, it was a boarding house that was uh, for white people, but this black woman ran the boarding house, and um, because she was a kind of independent in her work, she had space in the basement where she could have friends over. Um, and so her house became a kind of space um, where people came and told stories and talked about um, their past and reminisced. Washington eventually became a teacher of commercial art at Cardozo High School in Washington, D.C., which was a, the high, a business high school for African Americans within the segregated public school system of Washington. But his interest in Lincoln and the Civil War era didn't translate into writing and publication until 1935 and a public controversy about the identity of Elizabeth Keckley. So in 1935, a Washington journalist named Bess Furman, who was basically assigned to cover the Roosevelt administration, was doing a sort of side project on the history of women journalists in Washington, DC. And she interviewed a Democratic gadfly named David Rankin Barbie about a woman named Jane Gray Swisshelm, who was widely known as one of the first female correspondents to cover Congress. During the interview, Barbie, asserted that among her other accomplishments, Swisshelm had actually been the author of Keckley's memoir, Behind the Scenes. In fact, Barbie said, there actually had been no person named Elizabeth Keckley, who was a former slave, a skilled dress designer to the most prominent white women of Washington, and a confidant of Mary Lincoln. And this is the quote from the story. Barbie said his researches had convinced him that there was no such person at all as Elizabeth Keckley. Jane Swisshelm, in her other devotion to the anti-slavery cause, invented an ex-slave who made Mrs. Lincoln's dresses. Jane herself had been a dressmaker. <laughs> 
Barbie also said that a properly raised Southern white woman like Mary Lincoln was, quote, not the type of woman who would gossip before servants. No well-bred Southern woman would do that. He falsely claimed that Mary Lincoln bought her dresses in New York and Paris and had no need of a personal dressmaker. Okay, and this story was published in the Washington Star and went out over the AP wires. And so it was published in all over the country. Now, so Bess Furman, the reporter, uh, reported Barbie, as, story is a revelation. You can see that this headline is sensational book of Lincoln's time attributed to Saab's sister, right, who's Jane Swiss home. So in its own way, this was a, a sort of big story in the literary world. She was entirely unprepared for the ensuing backlash. As it turned out, African Americans all over Washington, D.C. were still alive who had known Keckley and knew her story, and they now came forward and perhaps the most vocal defender of Keckley's reputation, and indeed her very existence, was John Washington, a public school teacher. He had not known Keckley personally, but he knew many people who did, and he had an abiding interest in the history of the Lincoln administration and the era of the Civil War. Washington wrote a letter to the editor of the Star, and Furman, the reporter, surprised at this outpouring of people who had known Keckley, because Keckley lived until 1907, Furman started interviewing all of these people who had come forward, and she wrote a follow-up story, which she recorded in her diary, which is in the Library of Congress, as a correction, saying, oh, by the way, uh, it turns out that Keckley existed, and all of, I went to all these people's homes, and they showed me their personal photo albums, and they showed me pictures of her, and they told stories of her. And, uh, and so, uh, oops, I kind of got it wrong when I uncritically quoted Barbie. So Washington was moved to action by the reality that Keckley's story was in danger of being lost, and indeed that it was possible to so drastically malign a highly respected black woman from what he considered a heroic age. He embarked on further research on Keckley, hoping to do uh, continue whoa, documenting her life. Oh my gosh. Hold on. Okay, and so he wanted to document her life and uh, figure out who helped her write her book. And over time, he expanded that research um, to a project that he called The Colored Side of Lincolniana. He was about as well prepared to do this work as any African-American person of his generation. And I just, Du Bois was born in 1868, so Du Bois was 12 years older than John Washington. Du Bois was one of the few, he was the first African-American to get a PhD at Harvard. He was one of the few um, African-American people with PhDs in his era. And in the 30s, when John Washington embarked on his research, um, this was a period when history doctoral programs had finally begun to open their doors to African-American students. But the number of black PhDs in history was vanishingly small, and indeed most practitioners of African-American history did not have professional training in history or advanced degrees because they actually didn't have access to such um, degrees and institutions. But Washington's education was formidable. He had attended the Capitol's uh, elite public high school for black students, which was called the M Street High School. He then went on to earn three degrees from Howard University, a teaching degree, a Bachelor of Arts, and a dentistry degree. And by the 1930s, he was solidly middle class. He owned a home on Florida Avenue in LaDroit Park, um, which is a neighborhood near Howard University. And he also owned a vacation home in Highland Beach, Maryland, which was a vacation community founded by Frederick Douglass's son, uh, Charles Douglass, and kind of perpetuated during Washington's time by Ch Frederick Douglass's grandson, Haley Douglass. And so um, people, affluent uh, enough African Americans, uh, bought into this vacation community in Highland Beach, Maryland, because they were barred from um, vacation properties in uh, white developments, beach developments. So Washington worked as a commercial art teacher at Cardozo High School. Um, he had been an artist since boyhood, and his, in his book he described his early interest in painting and his efforts to paint and then destroy a picture of John Wilkes Booth, kind of as an effigy. Um, Booth, the memory of Booth and sort of the ghost of Booth terrified him when he was growing up in his grandmother's boarding house uh, next to Ford's Theater. He was involved in artistic circles as a young man in Washington, D.C. He was also involved in a nationwide association of black dentists, and he practiced dentistry when he wasn't teaching school, probably out of his home in LaDroit Park. 
So this was a very multi-talented man um, with an elite education for his era and broad interests, and now wanted to turn his attention to Lincoln, and in particular, Lincoln's relationships with African Americans. And I want to underscore how innovative this really was. No previous book on this topic had ever been written. Indeed, the world of Lincoln scholarship in that era was largely white, and no white Lincoln scholar had ever thought to write such a book. And he faced a problem of sources, and many of this, us in this room know how difficult it is to try to write the history of people who didn't leave behind written records or whose records had been destroyed or were no longer extant. And, and this is really important to me, that no one had thought to record the oral histories of African Americans who knew Lincoln in Lincoln's own era. And this is where Herndon's unfinished work comes in. William Herndon was uh, Lincoln's law partner and a huge fan of Lincoln. And after Lincoln uh, died, Herndon went around and conducted hundreds of interviews with people who had known Lincoln. And he was not discriminating in the sense that he interviewed the person at the corner store in small towns in Illinois and you know people who Lincoln had just had the most passing acquaintance with. And he created an archive that scholars of Lincoln have been using ever since and debating ever since. The credibility of the Herndon's archive, who were these people, to what extent can we believe them? It turns out that Herndon did not interview any African Americans. Um, he could well have, for example, William de Florville was a Springfield contemporary of Herndon's, and we know this, we, and we know it is highly likely that they knew each other, but there's no evidence that he interviewed Florville, much less any of the less prominent African Americans with whom Lincoln would have crossed paths in Springfield and in Washington, D.C. So to write the history in the 30s, to write the history of African Americans and Lincoln was to work in the wake of the racist or racially charged uh, assumptions of Herndon that black voices didn't matter, that black people of the origins of Lincoln's hatred of slavery. Herndon famously wrote of Lincoln's revulsion on witnessing a slave auction in New Orleans, a vignette that became central to early accounts of Lincoln's opposition to slavery. And historians have questioned whether that whole story was even true. But in any case, Herndon kind of popularized that story that Lincoln was at a slave uh, auction in New Orleans, and that was what kind of uh, turned him, made him realize the evils of slavery. Washington's book, They Knew Lincoln, was premised on a very different idea. The idea that, as he wrote, quote, Lincoln's views on the injustices of slavery did not all come from his visit to the slave markets of New Orleans. They were strengthened by his observations of the colored people who served him. So Washington was writing in opposition to the idea that it was the observation of passive, oppressed African Americans that shaped Lincoln's views. He was trying to write a history that showed that Lincoln knew black people in his everyday life and that those people helped shape his views on slavery and emancipation. And in fact, uh, William de Florville himself was a really important figure for Washington because Florville um, had come from Haiti and Florville was this very prosperous, very successful man in Springfield and um, Washington tried to put together evidence to suggest that knowing Florville in Springfield and knowing the history of the Haitian Revolution, which was of course an anti-colonial um, revolution that created the first black-led republic in the Western Hemisphere in the world, um, would have helped Lincoln understand that slavery was wrong, that uh, emancipation would lead to um, a successful, you know, uh, that black people were capable of governing themselves and that emancipation could be successful. So that is part of Washington's perspective. Um, so, so Washington is writing in the shadow of Herndon and in the absence of the kind of work that had been done to accumulate an archive about um, Lincoln and white people. Um, let me just say something about Washington's relationship with academic history writing. I'm going to skip those guys. <clears throat> um, Washington reached out to people in the Lincoln world to try to get help with his research and eventually found his way to a guy named James Randall, who many of you probably know is an eminent professor and Lincoln specialist at the University of Illinois. Randall is known for having insisted against people who said the Lincoln theme was exhausted, right? Um, Randall insisted there was indeed more to be learned about Lincoln, but it was time for professional historians to take over. And he was committed to the professionalization of the discipline of history and frowned on historians whom he considered amateurs. 
So Randall and Washington had met each other at the Library of Congress when they were both doing research. And Washington sent his first chapter to Randall in 1939. Um, then a guy named Harry Pratt from the Abraham Lincoln Association helped persuade Randall to get more deeply involved with Washington's project. Washington wanted to convince Randall that, wa that Washington was a true historian, a real historian. In one letter, Washington wrote to Randall that every fact in the book is quote, historically true, and that in telling about Lincoln's servants, the book would serve to supply, this is a quote, supply very valuable missing links in the biographies of Lincoln. But Randall liked the book for different reasons. He insisted that they knew Lincoln was folklore, not history. In one letter, he called Washington's work unhistorical legend, but said he liked it for such intangible things as quaintness, flavor, half-articulate race memories, and a quality which some would call in unliterary, but which amounts to expressive eloquence. Elsewhere, he call, uh, compared Washington's work to a Negro spiritual. So although Randall supported the book and helped get it into print, his endorsement rested on a view that the book was outside the scope of history writing and it was founded on a profoundly racialized, if not simply racist, view of Washington, whom he often characterized as giving voice to authentic racial feelings rather than being a bona fide researcher and intellectual. So let me, uh, since time is limited, let me just say a couple things about Washington's research. He, like so many of us who have worked in social history, he drew on every resource he possibly could. He conducted oral histories with people who were still alive, who had, who had been alive during the Civil War period, and with their descendants. He did archival research. He combed through federal government archives, much like the Freedmen and Southern Society Project would later do, finding, for example, Elizabeth Keckley's pension record, where she applied for a pension because her son had been killed in the Civil War, finding employment records of African Americans who had known the Lincolns but went on to work in the Treasury Department. So he was an incredibly enterprising and empirically oriented researcher, even though he was also facing these challenges of um, a lack of sources. He eventually secured a book contract with E.P. Dutton in New York with the help from the uh, rare books librarian at the Library of Congress who acted as literary agent. E.P. Dutton hoped to market the book not just to African Americans but to white audiences interested in Lincoln and they wanted a prominent person in the Lincoln world to write the book's preface. And Washington, who had met Carl Sandburg at the Library of Congress also, both Washington and Randall worked on Sandburg and eventually Sandburg wrote a preface. The book was highly successful and widely reviewed when it was released in 1942. Uh, it was reviewed in places like the Washington Post, the New York Herald Tribune, the New York Times. Most of the reviews were positive. Many reviewers recognized the unique contribution that the book made to the field of Lincoln studies. The book sold out quickly but was never reprinted. And so when I entered this story, um, the book was very rare. You could buy it from a used bookstore, used book collector for somewhere about more than $250 because it had never been reprinted and only these first editions existed. Well, first and second printings existed. Generally, this book represents Lincoln as a man of great empathy and humanity, a great leader who was profoundly shaped by his humble roots. It also emphasizes the dignity of the working class women and men who labor in the shadows of people like Lincoln, often with great integrity, intelligence, and good humor. And uh, you know, Washington was super positive about Lincoln in a way that was not necessarily shared by all African Americans of his era or before or since. So um, I want to kind of note that his extremely positive views on Lincoln were just one of many views of, uh, among African Americans on Lincoln in that time. He was 62 years old when the book was published, and he was something of a cultural conservative. Part of his motivation for elevating Lincoln in, this, in the 30s was his grandmother's, and sorry, excuse me, part of his motivation for elevating Lincoln and his grandmother's generation was Washington's own fear that popular culture and the jazz age were having negative influence on young people. And he was a teacher who encountered young people all the time. Amid the transformations of party politics during the New Deal, Washington remained a Republican, ever wary of the Democrats and their enduring connections with slavery and white supremacy. In fact, after the success of They Knew Lincoln, Washington envisioned writing a second book more explicitly designed to persuade African Americans to continue supporting the Republican Party. So this was an increasingly kind of unpopular position among um, African Americans. He died in 1964, the year Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, 
a law that finally helped bring to fruition some of the promises that the United States had made to African Americans back in the days of Reconstruction. He was 84 years old, and his wife of more than five decades, Virginia Ross Washington, had passed away just months before. Um, in the meantime, uh, they knew Lincoln was out of print, and uh, he was frustrated by that fact. So just to wrap up, uh, we have a tendency in general, I think this kind of continues, to segregate our histories, to separate great men from everyday people, men from women, black from white, and race from nation. John Washington rejected that kind of sorting. He believed black readers and white readers alike would appreciate his efforts, and he was right. His book brought African-American history in the homes, into the homes of Lincoln fans and collectors. He showed readers that the black people whom Lincoln encountered were real people with names and histories of their own, substantial people, not cardboard cutouts or stereotypes. Born in his effort to vindicate the life story of Elizabeth Keckley, they knew Lincoln challenged white people's tendency to ignore or diminish African-American history. It broke new ground by arguing that African-Americans were not simply passive recipients of Lincoln's benevolence, but shaped his attitudes. The book is a reminder that everyday people of the past lived honorable and even heroic lives, and their stories, too, are worth remembering. Thank you. Okay, and our final presentation for this uh, first morning session is by uh, Edna Medford of Howard University, The Unsettled Relation Between the Great Emancipator and the Emancipated. Good morning. I too would like to thank uh, Vernon and Peter for the invitation to be here this morning and for all of their hard work. I don't think I've encountered uh, any two people who have been so um, organized um, the next event I have at Howard, I'll have to invite you to come and help me <laughs> put it on. Uh, I am also, at least I count myself, um, an FOB and an SOB. Uh, I may be the oldest SOB in the room, okay? I think I was in the first graduating class that Vernon taught uh, when he finished graduate school uh, at the University of Illinois. Uh, we were both uh, toddlers at the time. We were not nearly as old as that sounds. So I want you to look around the room and tell me what is a bit odd. This is a conference about the unfinished work of Abraham Lincoln. And what do you see in the room? or what you don't see in the room. You don't see a lot of African Americans, okay? And it's something that I see time and time again when I'm at conferences, unless it's the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And <laughs> that's the one conference where you do have a lot of African Americans, and if we're talking about Lincoln, then everybody's there in the room. But generally, when I'm at a conference that talks about the Civil War or about Lincoln, I'm not surprised if I'm only uh, four or five people of color in the room. So uh, this phenomenon is, um, it, it transcends region, actually. Whether it's Miami or Boston, Richmond, Virginia, or Richmond, California, black people do not appear to have much interest in learning about the man who has been given credit, often exclusively for black freedom. Uh, one explanation is that the civil rights movement supplied black Americans with their own heroes. Hence, there was no reason to reach back uh, so far uh, for more than a century, actually, to embrace a white man's efforts on behalf of the enslaved. Another is that having been written out of the uh, narrative of the Civil War for most of the last century and a half, African Americans have little interest in the era or the man who has come to symbolize it. Yet another explanation is that black people just don't feel comfortable uh, in uh, what they perceive to be white spaces. 
And I think the question we need to ask is why would a Lincoln Conference and the Civil War be considered a white space? So that, that's something we really need to deal with. Perhaps these interpretations have some merit. The martyrdom of Medgar Evers, Dr. King, the civil rights workers who were sacrificed on the altar of voting rights and many others, the martyrdom is more immediate and perhaps more relevant to our times. And certainly the very active role of black men and women in their own liberation and in the preservation of the union has been until recently a contested subject and I hope that it's no longer contested. It may be in some circles, but generally we're in agreement that they certainly did play a very important role. But black America's ambivalence toward Lincoln did not develop overnight. In reality, it has been with us for as long as emancipation itself. Indeed, it developed before anyone labeled him an emancipator before he embraced black troops as an army of liberation, and before he called for the elective franchise for certain groups of black men. And through the decades since emancipation, the Lincoln image in the African American community has shifted as freedom's succeeding generations have measured their progress by the imagined promises of the emancipator and his proclamation. So African-American attitudes toward Lincoln were always complex. His first bid for the White House was received with skepticism by those who knew his political record and views, and with restrained hope by those who saw him as the standard bearer of the newly formed Republican Party and an anti-expansionist. After, after he won election, few found any reason to think he would be the savior that the enslaved imagined him to be. His appeasement of the seceded states, including his pledge to enforce the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, failed to endear him to the promoters of freedom and prompted Frederick Douglass to place him in the same category as James Buchanan and Southern sympathizers. While the Emancipation Proclamation and the acceptance of black troops into the Union Army tempered criticism, the new alliance was a fragile one. The disparate treatment of black soldiers by both the Union and the Confederacy, and that includes unequal pay, excessive fatigue duty, the latter's response to captives as if they were slaves in insurrection, earned the displeasure of those who recognized the importance of black men to the Union effort. Lincoln's assassination elevated his stature in the African American community but their response to his death reflected more than the sorrow of a grateful people. Lincoln became the symbol of freedom lost, of the death of a promise. They fervently believed that he, had he lived, uh, um, had he lived, uh, um, that they would have received the full benefits of uh, what was implied in the proclamation. It's always dangerous to try to rewrite something at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> because you lose, you lose track of what the hell you're trying to say, okay? okay. <laughs> but it did not take long for African-American leaders to discover that even in death, Lincoln could be useful. While he could not lead the charge for equality, they would use his martyrdom to appeal for justice from white Americans who had not shared his concerns for the welfare of a disadvantaged people. At the same time, they reminded black Americans of Lincoln's sacrifice and urged them to justify his faith and their ability to succeed as a free people. In their efforts, black leaders would have to reconcile the contradictions between Lincoln as emancipator and Lincoln as protector of the rights of white men and women. Doug Douglas acknowledged that contradiction in his eulogy of Lincoln less than two months after the assassination. Before a crowd gathered at Cooper Institute on June 1st, he declared that Lincoln, quote, was unsurpassed in his devotion to the welfare of the white race. But despite this, he was emphatically the black man's president, the first to show any respect for their rights as men. While at times 
Lincoln disappointed them. They believed in and loved him as a, quote, glorious martyr of freedom and human rights. Douglas noted that African Americans would have preferred Lincoln's motives for emancipation were other than military necessity and expediency, but that they chose to dwell on his efforts um, undertaken on their behalf. The Cooper Institute address was the first of many opportunities the former slave had to attach Lincoln's name to African American freedom and advancement. By the end of 1865, a post as post-emancipation violence and discrimination became routine, Douglas reiterated that African Americans would have been better served under Lincoln's protection. So while his death was a tragedy for the nation, it was an unspeakable calamity for the freed people. With Lincoln at the helm of government, full citizenship would have been secured and political control of the former Confederacy would have been denied to the secessionist. But Douglas could and did shape the emancipation narrative according to circumstances. By the end of Reconstruction, persistent challenges to black freedom from an unrepentant South an increasing Northern disinterest in the welfare of African Americans left Douglas disillusioned and frustrated. It was at this point that he ex accepted the invitation to deliver the keynote address at the dedication of the Freedmen's Memorial in the District of Columbia. The monument built substantially through the contributions of formerly enslaved people was intended to convey Africa, Black America's appreciation for the martyred president's efforts on their behalf. Douglas's speech, eloquent in its words and delivery, was divided into two parts, with the first being a candid assessment of Lincoln's actions during the war, and the second half acknowledging his ability to grow and to tower above his fellow Americans. He captured the sentiment of many who, like him, began to lose hope when confronted with the seemingly insurmountable challenges of the 19th, of, 19, of late 19th century race relations. Douglas used the occasion to speak to the government officials in attendance, President Grant and his cabinet, Supreme Court justices and lesser dignitaries, and by extension to the American people. In the shadow of a sculpture featuring an imposing Lincoln beckoning a half-kneeling enslaved man to rise and break the chains of bondage. Douglas praised the president for having overseen efforts that led to African-American freedom. But he now abandoned the sentiment expressed in the 1865 eulogy, now declaring that Lincoln was first and foremost the white man's president, that he was, quote, ready and willing at any time to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights uh, of humanity and the colored people to promote the welfare of the white people. Douglas reminded those assembled that Lincoln was willing to protect slavery inside the slave states, that he was willing to send the fugitive slave back to the master who was violently challenging the national government. White men and women were of greatest concern to him black men and women were a secondary consideration. It was a stunningly candid assessment of Lincoln's primary motivations for emancipation. But the implication was, if Lincoln could be so conflicted, but still issued the proclamation, other men and women could change their attitudes as well, and in fact, were obligated to do so. Nor was Douglas alone in his effort to use Lincoln's me memory to persuade white Americans to, to keep Lincoln's imagined promise. One leader after another, to paraphrase Douglas, fastened himself to a name and fame imperishable and immortal. They suggested that to honor him, to honor Lincoln, white Americans should remove the restraints that continue to keep black men and women bound and subordinate to make their freedom full and complete. White men should grow more and more like Lincoln in their compassion for the oppressed and disadvantaged, and I mean to include white women here as well. Increasingly, influential black men use Lincoln's memory 
and their effort to shape African-American attitudes and behavior. In doing so, they emphasized his humble beginnings, his legendary work ethic, and his devotion to justice. They believed that through Lincoln's example, black men and women who had been scarred by slavery could be taught to be honest, industrious, intelligent citizens, to be indispensable to their communities, to accumulate wealth and property and land holdings, to stay out of trouble by avoiding places of amusement. In fact, um, they expected black people to have very dull lives. The aim was to be a, quote, standing argument for the wisdom of Lincoln's action to justify the faith Lincoln had supposedly placed in them by issuing the proclamation. How ironic that Booker T. Washington employed this argument to win the trust of Southern white men. The image of the sainted, patient Lincoln supported the accommodationist stance Washington adopted for black America as the gains of reconstruction receded and hostility to black advancement increased. The president of Tuskegee Agricultural and Normal Institute, a model for industrial arts education for blacks in Alabama and throughout the nation, he recognized that counseling his people to embrace Lincoln's simplicity and honesty and hard work by laboring with their hands would win the favor of those very men who had opposed Lincoln's efforts in defense of union, but who would be less inclined to challenge the efforts of a non-offensive black man, and that's defined as those who were willing to give up social and political equality. Uh, Washington advised that they should expect little and seek opportunities for economic advancement in the South. His successor at Tuskegee, Robert Rousseau Moton, also counseled the need to show that black men and women were operating as responsible, hardworking citizens and that they had uh, and that they had justified Lincoln's sacrifice. At the 1922 dedication of the Lincoln Memorial, he outlined African-American accomplishments since emancipation, from increases in literacy, to land ownership and businesses, to the growth of a black professional class. He emphasized African-American patriotism, which was manifested in their commitment to defending the nation, to defending to defend the nation since the Civil War. And he took the opportunity to encourage white men and women to finish Lincoln's work by ensuring opportunity for all. Moton had planned to deliver a more strident speech to the largely white audience that, like the dedication of the Freedmen's Memorial nearly a half century before, included the nation's political leaders foreign dignitaries, and ordinary Americans. The original version of his prepared remarks praised Lincoln while criticizing the nation for not living up to the promise of the proclamation. And I quote, so long as any group within the nation is denied an equal opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, the work, um, he, he wrote, the work begun by Lincoln would remain unfinished. So long as any group is denied the fullest privilege of a citizen to share both the making and the execution of the law which shapes its destiny, so long as any group does not enjoy every right and every privilege that belongs to every American citizen without regard to race, creed, or color, that task for which the immortal Lincoln gave the full measure of devotion, that is still unfinished. Referencing Lincoln's House Divided speech of 1858, Moton asserted that with equal truth, it can be said today, no more can the nation endure half privileged and half repressed, half educated and half uneducated, half protected and half unprotected, half prosperous and half in poverty, half in health and half in sickness, half content and half in discontent, half free and half yet in bondage. As the only African American to speak at the dedication, Moton had been required to submit his prepared remarks to the Lincoln Memorial Commission. It could not have been a surprise to anyone, including Moton, that his speech was rejected as written. Forced to revise it, he, he delivered a diluted message that complemented the occasion's theme of a united America. 
the memorial was destined to become a gathering place for those committed to equal justice for all Americans. Marian Anderson's 1939 Easter Sunday concert on the steps after having been denied the use of Constitution Hall by the Daughters of the American Revolution was a reminder of the continuing power of the Lincoln image and the monument itself as symbol of the struggle for freedom. Then in August 1963, Dr. King would choose the memorial as the place to deliver his inspiring remarks at the culmination of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Approximately, uh, excuse me, appropriately, and not unexpectedly, he opened the speech with reference to Lincoln and the promise of justice and equality that for a century had been attached to his name. Five score years ago, he began, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. And like black leaders before him, Dr. King addressed the issue of true freedom denied. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. African Americans did not have to be reminded of their role at the periphery of American society. They lived it every day. The speech was meant to remind white America that the promise had not been. Uh, and uh, reminded people of his importance. Um, others were writing uh, of Lincoln in a different way. W.B. Du Bois was causing a stir by the observation that the president was inconsistent. In fact, he, he wrote in July in the Crisis Magazine that Lincoln was cruel and merciful at the same time, peace-loving, a fighter, despising Negroes and letting them fight and vote, protecting slavery and freeing slaves. But he adds in the end, he was a man, a big, inconsistent, brave man. Few heard the last words of the statement. Instead, they heard the, the negative part. He was inconsistent. Um, du Bois had to explain himself in a later issue uh, of Crisis indicating that uh, Lincoln uh, was big enough to be inconsistent. He talked about the fact that we have a tendency to go overboard when we're praising uh, leaders, that we forget that they were also flawed. And he suggested that when you do that, you really don't have a man, you have a shell of a man, and it's a cold uh, image that's left behind. Uh, a, a decade later, uh, Robert Van of the Pittsburgh Courier disturbed by the growing alignment of the Republican Party with segregationists, encouraged black people to turn Lincoln's picture to the wall because the debt had been paid. If ambivalence has been the characteristic of the relationship between Lincoln's memory and the African-American community, it remains so today. As they acquire a more balanced view of his motivations and actions in regard to the enslaved, it is difficult to hold on to the idea that he is owed uncommon loyalty and appreciation because he was a special friend of people of color. Doesn't mean that you can't respect him or that you can't honor what he did, but they're looking at this a little bit more dispassionately than perhaps the um, emancipated slaves did who did not know the full story of how they came to be free. <laughs> 
The old practice of invoking his name to get black people to follow his example has long since been discarded and replaced by a more nuanced understanding of a complex individual who, whether we like it or not, put country first. Rather than a rejection of Lincoln or the perceived promise of the proclamation, the seeming disinterest today has more to do with the realization that after a century and a half of struggle, black people have decided to look for solutions elsewhere. They have given up the idea that reverence for a moderate president will compel fair and equitable treatment. I don't think Lincoln would have been surprised at this at all. Thank you. Can we talk about the photos in your presentation because they were quite disturbing. Uh, the image of John Lewis looking up at the wall of Lincoln in 1947 and then the image of the book title, They Knew Lincoln, so they is anonymous. Uh, Lincoln is named, Lincoln's face, their pictures are actually quite opaque. And then uh, in the final photo from 1961, he doesn't look directly at the camera. He's sort of looking down. So I just thought if we could, I'd love to hear your meditations on those photos and what they mean for you. Um, thanks for that question. I am interested in your reaction. I, um, so first of all, the photos of Keckley and William de Florville are in the book. And Washington, as I mentioned, was among his many talents, was also an artist. And because he was a, also a commercial art teacher who dealt with a lot of uh, technologies of printing, he restored, he's the person who restored that photo of Florville. So he cared a lot about images and put a lot of images in his book, including the, those photos. And uh, the photo of him that, that I showed is his own portrait that he regularly sent to his correspondents. And I think that photo is interesting because it's a profile that fits some of the racialized ideas about civilization that were current at that time. So it shows him with a very straight down forehead and pointy nose, which those characteristics, people talked about photos and race and those type of characteristics that he's highlighting in his own photo were also about showing a kind of civilization, um, maybe a kind of proximity to whiteness. Um, so, so that's a comment on that photo, which he was very proud of. And you find in his, I didn't get a chance to mention that I never found his own correspondence. So all of the correspondence, but I did read a lot of his correspondence because they're in other, his letters are in other people's papers. So he often sent that photo of himself to his correspondent. Um, as for the original cover of the book, um, and the title of the book, so the book went through a very, uh, I don't know, like a very, it went through the ringer with Dutton, and that's a whole other story. The contents of the book were heavily edited. Washington and his literary agent had a big fight with Dutton about getting ch it changed back in some places, and so I never saw a discussion in the papers that I read about how the book would be titled, They Knew Lincoln, and, not, and as you're saying, not specifying who they is and so on. Um, I can only imagine, though, that it, I mean, it seems likely to me that the publisher would have chosen the title. Um, and it clearly, looking at how the book was marketed, they, uh, Dutton was, at first, when they first started marketing it in advance of the publication, they were sort of canny about saying that it was really a book by a black author about black people. Like they kind of were evasive about what the actual contents of the book were. But then interestingly enough, it was published in February to coincide with Lincoln's birthday and it wasn't widely known as Black History Month then, although it was then. Um, but by the time February rolled around, they were more, Dutton's advertising copy was more overt about it being a work of African-American history written by an African-American who they marketed as a descendant of slaves. Okay. The race that Lincoln freed was, I think, the language that they used. So anyway, I mean, there's a lot of complexity there. I really, actually really was delighted to find that 1961 photo spread when it said Potomac Magazine, but actually that's the magazine of the Washington Post. So for some reason, the post you know, people got word that there was by then this pretty elderly character who they, they did a little story and a photo spread on him. Again, 
On the one hand, yeah, he looks old and kind of, he's not looking directly at the camera, but they're highlighting his, his collection. And um, it's, a, it's a very respectful kind of profile of a, a member. It's sort of like, this is an interesting member of our community who we want to do a profile of. So yeah, sorry, that's a long answer, but I could go on forever. About Thank that. you so much. Yeah. I don't know. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Oh, yes, just to, just to, oh, just to quickly follow up on the, on the previous question, I, I couldn't help but noticing uh, in the caption of one of the photographs uh, of, of Washington, it said that his next book was going to be titled Lincoln's Chillin, spelled C-H-I-L-L-U-N. Uh, I assume that book was never written, uh, but I wonder how that speaks to Washington's image of himself, assuming that he chose that title. Well, I think, so first of all, that in his correspondence there's different ideas about what his next book was, ranging from this is gonna be a book of kind of political propaganda about why the Republican Party should remain really important to African Americans, to I have lots more stuff uh, that never made it into this book, I kind of wanna write a sequel. But I think that title sort of speaks to the problem that Washington faced as an author be, being somewhere between a historian and a collector of folklore. And so that kind of colloquial or you know, uh, language would have been the idea that this kind of work is best marketed as folklore, even though what he was clearly trying to do with They Knew Lincoln was be a historian and show that this stuff was documented. It wasn't, not to denigrate folklore, by the way, but like that this was, you know, documented, quote, you know, real history. So this is for uh, Professor uh, McDonald. Um, I enjoyed your talk. And uh, I wish you'd say a sentence more about the North Carolina regiment that I guess more or less mutinied at Fort Wagner. Uh, I just wanted to comment that, of course, we know about the uh, infamous Fort Pillow massacre committed by troops under Nathan Bedford Forrest, where they murdered, surrendered black POWs. But a lot of people don't realize that they also murdered a bunch of surrendered white POWs because they too were Confederates who had left the Confederate service and not just gone home, but had in fact joined the United States Army. And so this was a more widespread, and, and not all these people were tired of war because they joined up on the other side. Absolutely. Um, uh, all right, there we go, thanks. Um, a absolutely, and um, I have to say, uh, as a non-American, uh, I'm fascinated by the the wars and the, and the war stories that you people, I, I will use that phrase, um, <laughs> like to tell and continue to tell. I think one of the reasons that we don't see more working people, white or black, in this audience is that maybe we're not writing a history is a, that is of value to them, that doesn't speak to their experience. In my classroom, I, I teach too many returned veterans and too many people of both colors, and of many colors, who are, have, are making their way through the university uh, through ROTC. Um, and we perpetuate this narrative of glorious war that the soldiers themselves did not write at all. And we, the other point about it is that we, um, we, we really refuse to, um, with, with, striking, uh, with striking exceptions, I'm thinking of the Combahee rice workers that Professor Foner spoke about, we cut off the, the general strike at 1865, but it continued on. And white folks and black folks at the local level, at Walhalla, in Newbury, on Edisto Island, they fought those things out locally, and sometimes with, um, through arms and sometimes through other methods. Um, um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize in this paper is the, the importance of killing to war, of killing as the central job of, of war, um, as work.
Um, this is a nation that, uh, that idolizes American sniper as a victim, unbelievably, unbelievably. Uh, no non-American could imagine such a thing. But we continue to write that way. Um, the, the war continued on, and one of the things that should be taken from um, even American sniper is that killing works. And um, white Southerners who betrayed the cause of freedom understood that and pursued it. And those who defended freedom put down their guns. Maybe, the, maybe what was needed was a few more, or more than a few more, good firing squads. It's not simply a case that, that's, changing minds can be achieved through, perhaps through education, but, but I think that the history of your nation is that guns work. Um, that's one of the lessons that, uh, that we need to think about. That's a rambling answer, but I hope it covers some of the bases. One more question. If you see the chance of uh, the down in that corner of the building, if we change it, we can bring these people back up to the next group. Can you hear me? Okay, good, good. No? Is it working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, all right. Uh, several years ago, I, I did a lecture at the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg, and they have a habit of inviting high school students to come. Um, they pay for everything. And there was one young black woman in the group the year I was there, 15-year-old, who after my presentation came up to me and said, do you mind taking a picture with me? Because I need to let my parents know that there are other black people who care about the Civil War. Okay, that, that's really sad, but that shows you where we are. I agree with you, probably that whole idea of white space is really the answer, because you see it as well in other public places. How many black people go to uh, presidential libraries? How many go to the Grand Canyon or any of those kinds of national monuments? So I think it's something we really need to discuss and get a hold of. 